Alfred Hershey shared the 1969 Nobel Prize with Max Dellenbruck and Salvador Loria for their work studying the replication and genetics of viruses. Hershey's part of the award was in recognition for his work with Martha Chase in the early 1950s on the genetics of the T2 bacteriophage. Many introductory genetics courses rightfully treat the findings reported in Hershey and Chase's 1952 paper as pivotal to the widespread acceptance that DNA is the bearer of genetic information. Their work came at a time when most scientists believed that genes were most likely made of protein. This was the case even though almost 10 years had passed since Avery McLeod and McCarty showed that the transforming principle in bacteria was DNA. It is the existence of Avery et al.'s findings that gave Hershey and Chase's work so much significance, because their work with phage represented an independent set of experiments in a completely different system that supported DNA's dominant role in transferring genetic information. Because of the work of Avery's group, Hershey and Chase's findings were not completely unexpected, so were seen by many as confirmatory, providing powerful, independent support for the idea that genes were made from DNA. Hershey and Chase were part of the phage group, a collection of scientists who studied bacteriophage, which are viruses that infect bacteria. Specifically, they worked with the T2 phage, which is one of a number of related bacteriophage that infect E. coli. These are some of the most complex viruses known. They are DNA viruses with an outer protein coat that makes them look like little lunar landers. In many ways, the phage infection system was an ideal system with which to try to determine the role of protein and DNA in heredity as the phage particles were made of a strand of DNA surrounded by the protein coat, meaning the information needed for phage to use bacteria to produce more phage had to be made of protein and or DNA. There was no other option. The T2 infection process involved phage attaching to the outside of susceptible cells, and then after some period of time, the cells would burst, releasing a new generation of phage. These new phage, called progeny, were then able to repeat their infection reproduction process on new susceptible E. coli cells. At the time of Hershey and Chase's work, other researchers had shown that phage could be induced to release DNA under some circumstances, and phage particles lacking DNA were able to attach to susceptible bacteria but were unable to cause infection. The innovation that Hershey and Chase added to the study of phage was the use of radioactive isotopes of phosphorus and sulfur to separately label all of the DNA and protein in the phage. Isotopes of these two elements were chosen because the nucleotide building blocks of DNA are held together by a sugar phosphate chain, so they have a high concentration of phosphorus but contain no sulfur. In contrast, none of the common amino acids contain phosphorus, while two of them, methionine and cysteine, contain sulfur. Knowing this, Hershey and Chase reasoned that by tracking the movement of these isotopes, they could figure out if the DNA and protein components of the phage behave differently during the infection process. To create the radio-labeled phage, they first grew susceptible strains of E. coli in the presence of either P32 or S35. These bacterial cultures were seeded with phage, and the infection process was allowed to proceed. After one infection cycle, the radioactive phage were isolated. Those grown in the presence of P32 had radiolabeled DNA, and those grown in the presence of S35 had radiolabeled protein. They then used these differentially labeled phage to track the movement of DNA and protein in a variety of experiments. They started by extending previous work which had shown that exposing phage to osmotic shock by suddenly lowering the salinity of their culture media caused the release of DNA into solution. Using the radio-labeled phage, Hershey and Chase were able to confirm that the shock did separate the DNA and protein with the DNA remaining in solution while the outer protein coat could be precipitated using antibodies against phage protein. They then performed a series of experiments with heat-killed bacterial cells and bacterial cell fragments that showed that phage appeared to inject DNA through the cell wall, and once introduced into the cell, the DNA did not leak back out, suggesting that the DNA was not degraded once it entered the cell, and therefore likely remained part of larger macromolecules. 
For another well-known experiment, they calculated that the shearing force of a blender was great enough to remove phage from the surface of infected bacterial cells, but was not strong enough to disrupt the cells themselves, thereby allowing Hershey and Chase to separate the parts of the phage that entered the cell from the parts that remained on the outside. This has since become known as the blender experiment. With this approach, they provided additional evidence that DNA quickly enters the cell as soon as the phage attached to the bacteria, while the bulk of the protein remains on the outside, leaving it susceptible to being sheared off by the blender treatment. Their interpretation of this was that the bulk of the protein in the phage remained on the surface of the cells, and importantly was not involved in phage replication within the cell. They used the finding that protein stayed outside of the cell and DNA entered to hypothesize that if DNA was in the cell, it might be possible to detect the transfer of parental DNA into the progeny produced when infected cells burst. They tested this hypothesis by infecting bacteria with either P32 or S35 labeled phage and isolating the progeny that the infection produced. These experiments showed that significant amounts of P32 was passed into the viral progeny, but almost none of the S35 was detected in the progeny. The fact that the progeny incorporated significant amounts of parental DNA, but little or no parental protein, provided additional support for the idea that DNA was the molecule of heredity. The impact of this work on the larger community stemmed from the weight of evidence built up through each of these independent results. In isolation, none of these individual findings is completely convincing, but taken as a whole, Hershey and Chase built a coherent set of observations in support of DNA's importance. Their results, coming as they did after the findings from the Avery Lab, represent a major milestone in the larger scientific community's acceptance that genes are made from DNA. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions, and if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Primer, click the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.